Good evening. I'm Pastor Dave, and tonight is our second session looking at the Apostles' Creed. And specifically tonight, we are looking at the second article, which states, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Now, as always, I'm going to start us with a question. Who is Jesus Christ? Now, I'll be fair, this is not a trick question. This is one of those times you can give that Sunday school children's sermon answer and be correct. This is actually why it's important that we look at the Apostles' Creed, because the Apostles' Creed helps answer that question very clearly and succinctly. Now, we can do this also through looking at the totality of Scripture, Old and New Testament to get a sense of who Christ is, but that is summed up in this creed. And that's why we are doing this. And it's also an important thing we must do, because as Dr. Timothy Tennant notes in his Foundations of the Christian Faith, the book upon which I'm basing all of this, the creed answers that question in such a way that the full expression of the Christian faith, whether Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, we can all adhere to the answers in this creed. Now, what also helps us with this is the sheer importance in the summary. Think of the Apostles' Creed like the Ten Commandments. If you look at the Ten Commandments, there are ten clear, succinct rules. But what those ten rules do is pretty much sum up the 613 laws that are found in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. All the laws and rules there are summed up in those Ten Commandments. The Apostles' Creed does the same for us. It clearly and succinctly puts all the information from the New Testament into three paragraphs of about 12 articles. What this also does is help us to set clear boundaries of where the faith is. Now, within the United Methodist Church, we say that we are a big tent denomination, that as long as you're within the tent, you're okay. And although some, and to be fair, have pushed the boundaries of that tent. But this creed does the same thing. Think of all the denominations that I mentioned. There's many more I could have mentioned, many more ways of thinking, plus all the independent churches that are out there. The creed sets up a big tent for the Christian faith. And as long as you're within that tent, you're fine. Granted, just like within the United Methodist Church, there are some who do attempt to push the boundaries of that tent. And this is where we get into some things we list as heresies and some that kind of do the same thing, but we don't use the H word for. Now, historically speaking, two of the great heresies of the Christian faith is from the ancient days, are the Gnostics, who, just to make it clear and simple, they didn't believe Jesus Christ was God because God would not come in human flesh. Of course, there was also the Arians, who basically, their great heresy was they didn't see Jesus Christ as eternal. They saw Jesus Christ as a creation of God. Now, what's interesting is some of these same beliefs still exist in faith groups that some see as Christians, others, myself included, debate calling them that. I mean, Jehovah's Witnesses get into this, the Mormons, and even some parts of Protestantism and the Unitarians, when they say that Jesus Christ was a great moral leader, but not the Son of God. These ideas exist, and that's why we hold to the creed as saying this is the standard by which we hold people. Now, i got to give you a pop quiz. What does Jesus Christ mean? I'll give you a minute to think on that. Know the answer? It's pretty clear. Jesus
God saves. Pretty apt. Now, Christ comes from the Greek, and the Greek is Christos, which comes from the Hebrew for Messiah. Messiah, of course, meaning anointed one. But basically, when we say Jesus Christ, God saves Messiah. The Messiah sent because God will save. Learn something new every day. Now, we, when we say our belief in Jesus Christ, we do have to hold exactly to what that means. And in the Anglican Church of North America's new catechism to be a Christian, they actually give a pretty clear definition of who Jesus Christ is, summarizing a lot of scripture. As they state, Jesus Christ is the eternal word and son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity. He took on human nature to be the savior and redeemer of the world, the only mediator between God and fallen humanity. Now, one of the good things about catechisms are they really sum up a lot of scripture. And what I just read is based in scripture. If you want to look at John 1, verses 1 through 5, this is what John wrote. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overstood it. Basically, we can look at what John says, and we see the basis of the Trinitarian doctrine. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Jesus Christ is God as the Word of God is God. So I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. But we also see how eternal He was, because He was with God in the beginning. He was with God before the beginning of the earth, because Jesus was already there. And we also get the basically the language of the light of Christ shining forth. And it's not so much the light of Christ shining forth, but God shining forth. And this is where the Catechism of the Catholic Church actually helps us out a good bit. Because as they write in their catechism, following the apostolic tradition, the church confessed at the first ecumenical council at Nicaea in 315, that the Son is consubstantial with the Father. That is, one only God with him. The second ecumenical council held in Constantinople in 381 kept this expression in its formulation of the Nicene Creed and confessed the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Light from light. The light of Christ is the light of God because Christ is God. But we also get something else in there beyond the language of begotten, which so spent enough time in the King James, you already know what that is. But we get another word that is important, and that is consubstantial. Consubstantial. Do you know what that means? Take a minute. If you break it down with con and substantial and get to the root words, you can figure it out. Now I'll say there is a Greek word for this because in Christianity there's always a Greek word for everything. And the Greek word is homoousion. Homo being the root of same. Usion, essence, or substance. Basically, as consubstantial, 
means is of the same substance. God from God. This is different than what we were saying in human beings, that my son is not of the same substance as me. Even though I am his father, he is not the same as me. Now, if I had a clone, or in some cases I guess an identical twin, you could actually have same substance biologically. But here, what we're looking at is the idea of the Son of God is God. They are the same. And this is actually why our language we use is important. Now, last week I brought up some of the more modern, more inclusive language that people like, such as re creator, redeemer, sustainer. And part of my thing with that, and I'm not the only one, is we're saying what they did, not who they are. That's like just saying, calling me pastor. I'm like, well, that's what I do. That's what God has called me to do. That isn't me because a lot of other people are pastors too but it does something else that is very important i mentioned before about the big tent and the boundaries that are within that you start to take away who jesus christ is being of the same substance as the, as the father jesus christ is god this basis of our trinitarian doctrine and really you lose the relationship of father son within the Trinity, within the Godhead, kind of helping further establish who God is. But you can start to get into a God without definition, which would actually be very close to what Muslims believe of Allah. Their understanding of Allah is different than our understanding of God. And this does bring us back to the importance of why, especially I use the traditional Father, Son, Holy Spirit, beyond the fact it's been used for two centuries, and I like the continuance of language as we continue baptisms and other rituals and rites within the church. But it helps set the clear boundaries and definition of what we believe. But we also have to deal with the word Lord. Now this is where Martin Luther will help us out with his large catechism. Because, in par at least it's noted here in paragraph 27, it is, part of it says, But what does it mean to become Lord? It is this, He has redeemed me from sin, from the devil, from death, from all evil. For because I did not have the Lord or King, I was captive under the devil's power, condemned to death, stuck in sin and blindness. Without Christ, we have no Lord. We are subject to our sins because we are not redeemed, because Christ is not our Lord. But he goes on later. Let this then be the sum of the article here. The little word Lord means simply the same as Redeemer. It means the one who has brought us from Satan to God, from death to life, from sin to righteousness, who preserves us, in the same. Now, that goes back to that language thing. Because oftentimes we can say Christ is Redeemer. But Christ is more than Redeemer. As we see, God saves Messiah, Homoousia, consubstantial. Christ is God. This is God redeeming us, restoring us to God. Not just sending of a Redeemer. With an non-specified relationship but the lord does remind us who he is by what he has done but it doesn't get into the fullness but some of this is also seen elsewhere in scripture if you go to the letter to the hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 in the past god spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. kind of gives more to the Lord because he is Redeemer, but 
the Redeemer is still God. And this really only happens because Jesus Christ is God. Going back into the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 25 through 26. As Jesus speaks to Martha, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though they die, will live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? You heard me stumble over that because I say those words at every single funeral, which at this point has been quite a bit recently. <laughs> but it does remind us of the importance of clearly understanding who Christ is so we can truly believe in Jesus Christ. So as Jesus asks Martha, I ask you the same tonight. Do you believe this? It's a question we all have to answer for ourselves. Now, I'm going to continue to give you that same homework assignment because this is important. I will remind you to continue to work to memorize the Apostles' Creed. It's not something that you have to do in one week. We have many more weeks to get through this creed if you've been looking at it. But continue to memorize it so you immediately know what the beliefs of the Christian faith are. However, if you do want to go further, you can go into your Bible to Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Now in the church, we often dwell on Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, the great commission of the church. But I want you to look at the preceding verses as well and really ask yourself on whose authority was the commission made? And what does that authority tell us about the one who gave us that commission? Now next week, we're going to continue our look at the Apostles' Creed with the third article, which states, Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. That one should be fun. But until next week, I'm Pastor Dave, and have a blessed night.